our no, our next presenter is Leslie Townsend. Um, she will share with us uh, about innovation in panels um, evolving from the traditional models. Uh, Leslie has spent her career working on this mobile marketing research world. Uh, ten years ago, she co-founded the Kinesis Server Technology uh, with the idea to capitalize all the wireless device to fill this critical gap that we had in this. And, and now we are living on this gap. And I think it will be very nice to hear what she's going to share with us. Please, Leslie. Thank you, Rafael, and thank you so much. Um, I'm going to talk about innovation in panels, and I think that there's really two primary things driving the change in the, the panel industry right now um, in, in terms of market research. One is, of course, the technology shifts that we hear about so much right now. Another one, frankly, is hyper-competition, and I think for the most part, hyper-competition only happens when there is perceived hyper-opportunity. So that is uh, also going to be addressed. Let's see here. There we go. So let me um, talk just a minute about the traditional uh, way that panels came about and evolved in our industry. For the most part, um, these started during the early 1990s when people saw the um, opportunities for online research to deliver at a uh, reduced cost structure and in a more timely fashion. And um, this may have, just go back one step. Nope. There we go. Um, so, so what happened was that people who had web assets drove these to a registration site, a website, where people went through what is called in our industry the double opt-in model. You would fill out a quick form, you would have an email that was automatically triggered and sent to you, and you would click on that form, possibly providing more information, and that would... Uh, mean that you were opted into that panel and you were who you said you were. And in the beginning, you were who you said you were. Um, and right now, at this point in time, we still have a lot of panels that use this model and they're successful. In particular, the enterprise uh, panel segment does this quite effectively for customer feedback. And it's relatively easy to evolve from these kinds of models into others. Um, we see also in the B2B space, in what I would call specialty, specialty panels, where you have a very uh, specific targeted audience that is a member of that panel, and in pharmaceutical panels, where you have physicians, this still works quite well. But through time, uh, some problems occurred. One was that uh, panels became, panelists became not who they said they were. They uh, came in under multiple email addresses, and they tended not to be unique. So we had to start adding additional processes on top of this whole double opt-in model. And so now, typically when panels are built, respondents are authenticated to make sure that the people are real unique and that they're not um, in there more, multiple times. We also found that the recruitment sources that we were using um, tended to create some research bias. And then we had to get uh, people from multiple sources. So that led to panel companies quickly beginning to change assets or, pa or panelists with one another. And therefore, it led to the problem that when you bought a panel panelist uh, who was filling your survey from someone, they actually may have been coming from a totally different company than the one that you hired. And that goes on today as well. Uh, true story, we have a client who has a very, very large tracker, 
Uh, they fill about 50,000 completes to, to this tracker. They decided they wanted to use two different panel companies to source it. Both are leading global panel suppliers. And uh, it had been going for two or three years with these two suppliers. They started digging very, very deeply into the panelist IDs and, that f and found that one of the vendors uh, who was providing the panelists was merely sourcing all of them from a third competitor and marking it up. So it's, it's very, very common practice. So um, multi-sourcing and trading, I think, is going to be actually more a part of the model going forward, not less. Um, we've also discovered that the people who opt into these panels are behaviorally different from people who do not opt into panels. So we created river sample for people who don't have to profile themselves, and we recruit through social media because those people don't necessarily have to give any information, including email, about themselves at whatsoever. And that has helped balance out the behavioral sampling. But a lot of times the people who source from those, um, those different models are different, and it takes a lot of uh, work and energy to combine them into a representative sampling framework. And of course, we still continue to have um, questions about professional survey takers themselves as well we should. And in a way, we've created these professional survey takers because we've created this model uh, that is totally based upon uh, what I would call um, uh, incentive encouragement, and in fact, that the, the double opt-in model that we use today works best when the incentives are, are highest. We've also tended to overuse respondents in many part of the parts of the world. The research market has turned out and grown faster than the number of people in the underlying databases. So. Um, this, combined with the fact that the underlying experience that, serve, that research participants engage in, the survey itself is not always well designed, tested, and often quite lengthy, has led what I, to what I would say is a very, very broken model. <clears throat> and um, then we combine, on top of that, some very fundamental technology changes mobile technology, social media, location-based services, the heart of this session today, as well as uh, the growth and popularity of communities and MROCs. And in a time of great stress and shrinking margins, panel companies have got to invest and stay on top of these technologies, which really are the heart of their growth and change. So I'm gonna focus next on uh, Solomo, which I think is one of the biggest innovation and opportunity areas within panels. Um, right now, if you take a look at um, SoloMo, it's utilizing social media, location-based services, and mobile technologies, but all together. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, we did a study with uh, a company called Illuminous, uh, another Austin, Texas-based company, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, in fact. And they studied the behavior of survey respondents who preferred to use their mobile device, were forced to use their mobile device, or used a web device, uh, um, desktop or, or an iPad. The people who chose to use their mobile device, not surprisingly, were the most likely to also use location-based services and use uh, social media in combination, and 76% of them fell into that category. Right now, more than half of Facebook's 850 million users use um, so access it on their mobile device, and the statistics are similar with Twitter, about half. So um, what we're talking about here is an area of innovation that can uh, replace the way that traditional scanning type data is collected by gathering it at the point of uh, sale or consumption. So in a typical enterprise type um, 
environment, you might think of someone going into a particular store if they've opted in to share their location information with that brand's app while they're in the store. They may be served up coupons and uh, asked to provide additional information while the, they're in the store. And that would be uh, an enterprise application where the, uh, the app the mobile app may actually belong to the brand and not necessarily to the research agency. In the public access uh, space, we have some other models that are being used, and that would be where you take an application such as Foursquare that automatically shares uh, location-based information, or it can be the research, br the research or panel company's uh, brand app, and you can build that component into it. And as it tracks your location, it may be that uh, a you have a particular client who wants to know when you're shopping in a particular type of, of store, or an, as an example, you're shopping for an automobile, and they want to know every time that you hit an automobile dealer, and they serve you up um, a survey throughout that experience. So that would be solo mo in action for panel companies, and we have quite a number of companies doing this. There is extreme uh, sensitivity around the collection of uh, location-based information. It's not something that you would want to launch into without understanding the privacy regulations, particularly when you need to track. Uh, it's, it's quite a, a big difference, a big step from gathering information when you're uh, doing a single location-based intercept versus tracking that person through time. <clears throat> so um, I also want to talk just briefly about communities because, um, let's see if this is, there we go. Uh, communities are so something that a lot of our panel uh, clients are leveraging to a great extent right now for additional revenue opportunity. Increasingly, the website that the panel uses to convey information about itself and to recruit from requires more and more engagement items on there. And one of the ways to keep people engaged is simply to run very isolated communities on that site that are only visible to particular types of people. So for instance, uh, running a, um, a particular study for, let's just say, um, a given ethnic group, income group, who's shopping for a particular type of product, and asking them and inviting them to a structured community for a week. Uh, this is a new type of, um, of revenue opportunity that helps monetize the panel for qualitative exercises and can be run by the panel company themselves. Then we get into um, another area altogether, and it's, it's quite a complex one, but it's the sample exchange. I think that because panel companies have long operated in a symbiotic uh, relationship with one another and have this need to, for a wide variety of recruitment sources, that the exchange grew quite naturally. Um, there's many different models, and um, a lot of panel companies essentially offer their own exchange where they're allowing their clients to come in and purchase and s the sample, see the size of the sample source, and that sort of thing. But what we see evolving also are what I would call the industry exchange, where all the panel providers come into a single exchange. Uh, a company can come in and select the, all the panel companies that they want to use what they're willing to pay for particular types of panelists, set up business rules, and essentially walk away. And those exchanges read the quotas from their surveys, begin inviting, pulling and inviting sample automatically, and it fully automates the uh, sample buying and selling process, essentially re removing the project manager from the equation. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of the large market research companies are doing this right now, and I think it, it is a cost-shifting paradigm for 
the, um, the smaller and mid-tier market research companies who will have to follow. I have not had time to get into um, the, the next step, which is uh, the entry of Google, Twitter, and Facebook. That's been at the, really at the forefront of discussion in the panel industry over the last year. Right now, they're playing very, very different roles with the, uh, the major internet players, focusing on mu a much more simple component, uh, delivery component, than the large panel companies who are focused on more complex uh, and ongoing projects. Um, you can see from the, here uh, the complex quotas and a lot of those types of um, items. You would go to a panel company typically and not one of the internet players. But there will be increasing competition and movement in from, from these companies and others. And I think that the industry exchange is one way that we will see uh, some pushback against these companies by combining into a, a common industry framework. So just to close quite quickly, I was trying to think what does this mean from the perspective of the panelist experience in the future. <clears throat> I think that standalone panels moving forward are going to have a bit of, of a rough road unless they can deliver a new level of content. Essentially, the content uh, becomes what attracts you to that site and why you would sign up and allow your information to be used. So surveys and, and uh, data collection are just becoming a natural byproduct of interaction with the web. They are not um, necessarily something that you're going to sign up for quite as much in the future. You're going to be giving and sharing your information in bits and pieces here and there. And the panel company will assemble some of this company, uh, some of this information. The internet players will have perhaps a great deal more. And how that all flushes out should be quite interesting. For this region, what is uh, so interesting is that the growth is already quite phenomenal compared to some other regions, particularly with uh, the percentage of people coming online. Social media, uh, this is a very, very vibrant region in the world for social media. And, um, you know, it's all poised to happen at once. I think that growth in this region could outstrip that in many other regions just because of the influences and behavior here. And I'll just share in parting what one of my, um, one of my clients who is in a, a very different emerging region uh, said to me, we, we had a, a long discussion after their, their uh, demand for research basically tripled in one month is in a developing uh, region with developing technologies, it's best not to plan too conservatively. You want to plan for maximum growth. So that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Leslie. Um, okay, well, we got a lot of information again. Well, do you have some uh, comment? Question. I have a lot. Oh, there we have. Do we have Mike? Natalia from Datos Claros, Espanol. Translation? Could you? Or oh, Rafa? I would like to see the previous slide. Oh. The previous slide. <laughs> that one? Yeah. I, I would like. To Uh, okay, I will speak in Spanish. A mí me gustaría saber, me gustaría saber si puedes explicar un poco más el proceso del startup y los costos. Sí, ¿qué, qué significa, digamos? Me, me interesa mucho ese proceso que marcó. Well, um, yeah, I was running out of the time at, at the end there because I, I believe that's um, to be a a, a unique panel company to bring something as a standalone panel company you're basically uh, it's very difficult to do that on a, a local or regional basis 
and a very high level of interactivity needs to be brought um, to, uh, to attract those respondents. So I think of uh, building a site that is really the engagement factor itself and the respondents are the byproduct of that. It gets, you know, it gets to be a tougher and tougher game all the time and uh, that means, uh, and particularly with the, the, um, the international aspects, more and more of the panels are international in nature. So. That's there in the back side? Mm hmm David. <laughs> Hi. So I'm curious, on the topic of engagement, uh, and obviously one way is to pay people, right? Incentives can be king in this sense. But I'm wondering what kinds of experimentation of any have been made to try to actually create amusing or interesting or you know adventure-like experiences to change the nature of the panelist experience in interacting with the research event such that it becomes self-reinforcing so that we're not always saying, I know this is boring as hell, but I'm gonna pay you money. Well, I think a lot of people have experimented with giving uh, to social causes, and that's been not so effective, but of great promise is the fact that the younger generation is much more motivated by that than um, middle-aged and older people, so that may be uh, effective in the future. We've tried games, and there is an element of the population that is willing to be motivated by more chances to win and to play games, but those are expensive to develop too, and a lot of a lot more time and money can go into developing those than into actually paying incentives. I think that through time, what's going to happen is that the incentive is the experience itself, the ability to give inf information that you feel will be useful into uh, in developing a product or feedback on a particular service you've used or an article that you want to read and you understand that you're getting something in exchange and if we start to tailor the experience in a way that's meaningful to people which uh, going back to what Andrew said means shorter simpler surveys even our web surveys should be shorter and simpler they should follow his rule too um, because going forward, the, we're going to use whatever device we want to use. You're not going to be able to control the device they use. And, and that will, um, when you're asking people for a few minutes of their time, a couple of questions, uh, maybe 10, you may not need to give the incentive because you're not asking so much. You're asking for something that's extremely germane, um, relevant to them. Thank you. Mm -hmm.